the sense, especially with the work you guys have done on your case studies. I can see that you're in it now. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to give us all the answers in the cahoots game. That's why. Uh, yeah, I was actually planning on just giving you all 100%. Everybody but Zach gets 100%. <laughs> Makes sense. Zach, you get 50% of the score you earn. So if you get an 80%, you now have a beautiful 40% looming. Makes sense. All right, so our objectives for this lesson, um, you guys have this video. This video, did it work for you? Alina? No. No? I had to Google it. Then it said yes. It didn't work. Mm, I'll double check. Facebook. We'll talk about it. It just goes through over the extent of burns. So I left my mouse on campus. Were you able to Google it though? The right one? Yeah, I just typed in the uh, emergency medicine and then burns and it was like the first or second on YouTube. Okay, I'll look and I'll post it on D2L. So our four types of burn injuries. So pretty cut and dry here. And what I wanna say about burns is that really it's just hypovolemic shock. So you're going to have a lot of repeat information that's related to hypovolemic shock. So if you have a pretty clear cut idea of how hypovolemic shock presents and the treatments that we do for it, the only difference is this is more of a relative hypovolemic shock. We've got fluid that that skin membrane is completely destroyed. Sometimes internally the capillary membrane is destroyed. And it's not just just it's not just destroyed because of the widespread inflammation where the body is working to repair and restore that capillary membrane. It's like destroyed, destroyed. It's literally burned off. Um, so that's why the progression of care for a patient with burns is so much more complex. But again, there's going to be a lot of reiteration of information you've already learned. So Thermal burns, chemical burns, smoke inhalation injury, and electrical burns. Thermal burns are going to be the most common. Um, people who are at greatest risk for burn injuries are, well, we can go occupational hazards. So if you're a chef, you're working in a hot kitchen, if you're working with a lot of chemicals, healthcare workers are at greatest risk for burn injuries as well. Healthcare workers are at greatest risk, risk of all of the different types of burn injuries because we're dealing with chemicals, we're dealing with live oxygen. Um, we're dealing with electricity, a lot, lots of different things. Um, so strategies to prevent each type of burn injury, know what you're working with and how to manage it. So if you're an electrician, you know, making sure that the electricity is shut off. By the way, over the weekend, I did some deep breathing exercises and really worked on being able to talk faster for this lecture for you guys. You're welcome. I really tried to get it so that I could just go through this lecture like blah, 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 blah. So that's my plan. As long as it's on YouTube, we're good. <laughs> yes, I will upload it to YouTube. Or I'm going to try to talk slower. Um, so strategies. So if you're working with chemicals, having the material safety data sheets near you um, for each and knowing kind of the progression of how to care for a burn if it does occur. Eye wash station available. A lot of chemical burns come from splashes, um, usually affects the upper extremities or the face. Uh, making sure that you have the appropriate equipment to wear um, for each type of burn. And then flash injury, making sure you know your hands are protected, um, that you have something, you know, if you're transferring hot objects, that the room is clear, those types of things. Patient education related to kids, patient education related to geriatrics, kids, they obviously don't know. Um, electrical sockets might look like a great place to stick a toy into. Older adults have decreased sensation, so they may not be as quite as aware of a burn when it's occurring. So thermal burns caused by flame, so actual fire itself. Flash, which is a great burst of heat that can cause a burn, usually first or second degree from a flash burn, or you have scald injuries, which are from water and other substances, um, and then or contact actually touching hot objects themselves. 
Um, I think I've, I think I've probably had all three of these. Anybody else in that same boat had all three of these types of burns? Technically four. I think my favorite is when I went to Bonnie, Benny Hanna as a child and I reached over and just put my hand right on top of that grill, that Ooh. hot abachi grill. I know. I'm so smart. I, asked, I had an electrical injury too. When I was a kid, I was playing with the cord of a lamp and the cord was frayed and I got electrocuted by the, the lamp cord. Every, and look at me, I turned out just fine, right? No deficits. <laughs> maybe, maybe some slight deficits. Um, so severity of the injury depends on the temperature of the burning agent and the duration of the contact time. Our body is equipped with very good pain receptors. Those nocioreceptors, as soon as you touch a hot object, it travels to your brain lightning quick, so quick that what's your initial response? Pull it away. Pull it away as soon as possible. This may be delayed in your older adult. So here, and there's four stages of, part of your your thermal burns and chemical burns. Um, basically, technically any burn that besides your smoke inhalation that affects the body is gonna be first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree. First degree, as we know, is a superficial partial thickness burn to the um, burn. This looks more like it would be a deep partial thickness. Superficial is gonna be your first degree is gonna just be like your standard sunburn. No blistering, no tissue, um, no tissue edema. And we have full thickness thermal burn. Um, so full thickness, third degree and fourth degree involves muscle tendon and eventually our fourth degree is down to the bone. This is a scald injury and sad. It looks like an older adult that was immersed in hot water. So we can see this is a superficial, um, I would say probably more like a deep partial thickness burn. So your Lundbrauer chart is going to be more accurate. This is what they're going to use in the hospital and burn centers. Um, it really kind of uh, identifies the percentage of what the patient is burned. And so that we can formulate our Parker-Baxter formula to do fluid resuscitation. With our rule of nines, this is what you guys are responsible to know. And this will, you know, just kind of have some good knowledge to have about um, there may be a question on HESI about rule of nines, or maybe a question on NCLEX about rule of nines. Um, I do want to say that I want you to go by our rule of nines chart that we have here. So we have our 4.5% for the face, anterior arms, and posterior arms would each count for 4.5. So your whole arm, a circumferen circumferential burn around your whole arm would be 9%. Um, 18% for chest, 18% for back, and then 9% for anterior and posterior sides of the leg. Your HESI might go into more detail. I will not, but just to keep in mind, if you're doing HESI, you know, questions, evolve questions, it might say the anterior aspect of the upper arm. So we would further have to divide that into 2.25%. Okay, I just want you to keep that in mind. I, I will not, if it's, if it's the arm, it's the arm, okay? It's the upper extremity, it's the anterior portion of the upper extremity, it's 4.5%. I'm not gonna give you a question where it's like they burnt their anterior surface of their left hand and you guys have to figure out one fourth, 1.125 maybe, does that sound right? Yeah, 1.125%, I'm not gonna make you do that, okay? But HESI, NCLEX, they might. So just kind of keep that in mind, make sure that you're really reading the question and what specific body part is accounting for. Um, groin counts for 1%. Some men accounts for 0.5%. Mm -hmm. I love that joke. And I will tell that joke to every single group of students. Well, then forever. some should be 2%, right? Some are 2% and some are 0.25%. <laughs> so, hey, I got a question. Yeah, what's up? With the chart, is this going to be like, pretty much specific to thermal burns because like Cassie was saying earlier the iceberg effect with the electrical burns and then like with chemical especially if it's alkalotic like a lot of the damage is done under the done tissue under yeah under this is tissue. specific for thermal burns okay. um it may be used for electrical burns after the extent of injury outside as visible outside of the body but 
thermal burns is going to be your key for your rule of nines. What we can visually assess on the patient, a patient is in a house fire and they come out, we can do a, you know, we can do our A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. We can go ahead and do our rule of nines to determine the extent of injury. And then also, you know, we're thinking there's probably some smoke inhalation injury and those kinds of things. So is the neck considered part of the chest and part of the back? When you're... Neck is considered part of the chest. So okay. but if you see chest, it's, it's in with the neck, it's in with the neck. You don't have to separate that out. Um, if you see the face, it's just that 4.5% for the face, but the, okay. it's not so much chest and back. It's more like the trunk. Mm -hmm. See, cause it even kind of includes the butt. So the trunk. So our chemical burns, so result of contact with acid, alkalized, organic compounds, um, alkali burns, you know, I've read this in the book. Every time I look at this, it's, so this is why it causes so much damage when we swallow an alkali burn, because what happens is that an acid is buffered relatively quick. Um, our body's able to neutralize it, whereas an alkali burn continues to eat through tissue and breaks down fat. So it can move faster and much deeper and can continue 72 hours after the injury. So you can imagine if somebody swallowed how difficult that would be to manage, especially when it's internally. An alkali burn spilled on the arm, um, you know, might cause like a, like a third degree, like a, a deep, superficial deep thickness burn, or it could be full thickness, just depends on how long that liquid is left on there. So leading into chemical should be quickly removed from the skin. This is where our material safety data sheets comes in because we want to make sure we're not using water for something that that could have a combustion reaction with clothing kind of like how you doff your PPE, um, kind of removing the clothing so that it's bunched up where the chemical is, making sure that we're not exposing ourselves further or if you're helping the person that you're not exposing that person, yourself, your person to the chemical. Um, and then just educating that after receiving the appropriate treatment for those alkali burns, tissue destruction may continue up to 72 hours. So it's only certain chemicals to not use water with though, right? To rinse yeah, off. it's water is usually a safe bet, but there are some chemicals where, especially if it's more like oil-based in nature, water will actually make it worse. The eye wash stations, I believe have 0.9, like a, like a saline wash in it which is usually effective if the chemical splashes in your eye. A picture, well, there's a couple of people that haven't did the activity yet, but I like those pictures. Um, kind of hard to see online. I have them in person where we do the activity, but. Um, are there chemical burns? Are you going to like, um, I guess I like state what kind of chemical to figure out if it was like an acid burn or alkali burn, or would it just, would you just come out and tell us like the patient has a acid burn due to like household cleaners? No, there's a nice chart in your book that has the different alkali chemicals. And um, I think it's actually under poisonings, but you don't have to know the different poisonings and the different types of chemicals. So it'll be either, either be alkali or, or acid. Um, so our smoke inhalation, smoke inhalation injuries can cause two problems. So we can have an upper airway injury or we can have a lower airway injury. An upper airway injury is the mouth and the top part of your um, trachea and then your lower airway, your lower trachea and your lungs. So it can be inhalation of uh, hot air, noxious chemicals, also inhalation of carbon monoxide um, causes damage. Uh, smoke is very irritating to the, the trachea and to the mucosa. So it causes damage to the respiratory tract. If, if too much smoke is inhaled into the lungs, it can also cause a lot of inflammation in the lungs leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
Um, so that re reason why it's a major predictor of mortality and burn victims is because if it's an upper airway injury, we've got that inflammation that's occurring at the site. We've got edema and we've got our um, inflammatory mediators moving to that site. So you've got swelling and we can have something that's called mechanical obstruction where it's, it, it represents like almost like an anaphylaxis where we've got that bronchial constriction um, and, and inability to breathe. Another major predictor is the fact that if it does turn into ARDS, we know the mortality rate of ARDS is 50%. So um, patient will need to be mechanically ventilated with a high PEEP and see if they can go ahead and um, turn around. Um, reason why it needs to be treated quickly. It can develop rapidly. Metabolic asphyxiation, and this is also known as dissociative shock. So it's one of your shocks where um, your body has oxygen on the hemoglobin, but carbon monoxide is a, forms a much easier and stronger bond to hemoglobin than oxygen does. So if you're inhaling carbon monoxide, but you're inhaling our 21% air as well, your body is going to pick carbon monoxide over the oxygen. The rest of that oxygen that's traveling through the body is going to get used up. And then all that blood that throws, flows through the body is carrying carbon monoxide, which is not going to be doing our body's work, right? So what happens is acute asphyxiation from carbon monoxide poisoning. The problem is it's tasteless, it's smellless, and it's obviously we can't see it. So that's why we have carbon monoxide detectors. And another thing with carbon monoxide is you have like cherry red um, flushing on the skin. And because of the displacement, the patient might become confused, disoriented, blurry vision, and then they pass out. So unable to get the help that they need to be removed from an area where there's carbon monoxide. Is this the one where they put you in the hyperbaric chamber? Yes. It is where they put you in the hyperbaric chamber, but our first initial, if we catch it early enough, it's just going to be 100% humidified oxygen with um, a non-rebreather mask. Okay, 100%. So the term, so you've got hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen to the tissues because CO is, is binded to that hemoglobin. Um, the term for that is carboxyhemoglobinemia, which basically is just saying it's carbon monoxide attached to the hemoglobin, um, and then eventually death if left untreated. So our upper airway injury, injury to mouth, oropharynx, and then that upper trachea or larynx, um, thermally produced. So usually there's, you know, some um, flame injuries that occur uh, with smoke inhalation injuries as well, but not always, you, you know, if it's the one that's like not the stop, drop and roll, but the one where like you're supposed to crawl, isn't there something that they say about that? You're supposed to crawl like under smoke because it's yeah. Smoke I thought there was like a fancy little, like a, like a stop, drop and roll thing. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, you want to crawl under smoke, keep your chin tucked so that your nose and your mouth are facing the ground. Um, so it not always occurs with a flame injury. It might be on its own, just smoke. Has anyone seen This Is Us? Um, yes, but which part? The part so where, he, spoiler alert, the part where he dies because of smoke inhalation injury and he goes into VFib. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like went back to the hospital and he was fine and stuff and then like the next day or something or like hours later mm -hmm. you should watch the show it's great it's not sad at all <laughs> nobody dies um so inhalation of hot air steam or smoke again causes that inflammatory reaction um within the throat um swelling maybe maybe massive and onset rapid so eschar is like dark necrotic tissue that forms um from lack of oxygenation um, and then edema might compromise the breathing. Um, swelling from scald burns. So if you inhaled a bunch of hot liquid and it went down your trachea for some reason, um, uh, and same thing with that scald burn, it destroys that 
um, initial the top membrane, and then you've got massive swelling from that fluid moving in. So lower, air, lower airway injury, so injury, injury to trachea, bronchioles, and alveoli. Um, so injury is really, we can inhale some smoke. Um, and this is different. This is not like cigarette smoke. This is different smoke that comes from a fire. It's a lot more um, irritating. So the length of exposure, how much smoke was actually inhaled. Um, and then we know that pulmonary edema that's associated with ARDS, there's that um, with drowning, it's just like the 24 to 48 hours. So we want to make sure we're monitoring them for two days. It's the same thing with smoke inhalation injury. We want to be monitoring them for two days to see if they've developed pulmonary edema, how that's going to present is your patient's going to have a pink frothy sputum. Um, they're going to have some dyspnea and you're going to hear some crackles. And then your chest x-ray is going to show that initial stage of those, you know, um, areas of whiteout in the lung. So electrical burns and chemical burns can cause coagulation necrosis as well. Um, electrical burns are more known for it because of the intense heat that's generated by an electrical current. When it travels through the body, there's no, you know, there's no like with a chemical burn, it has to like eat through the tissue. You know what I mean? Like it has some time. And obviously if there's chemical burn, we're not just going to sit there watching like, oh, look what it's doing to my arm. Like we're going to be taking care of it right away with an electrical burn. You can't, right? It travels so fast. It goes right through your body and everything that it touches as it moves through, it kills that tissue, destroys it. So coagulation necrosis is the blood stopping, the circulation stopping and any area that that intense heat travels through. The good thing about an electrical burn is electri electricity, as I talked about when we did CPR, is lazy. It wants the least pathway of resistance. So it's going to travel through blood vessels and tendons and the periphery. It really would prefer not to travel through fat, muscle, and bone and organs. Um, but if it does have to go through organs, obviously we're gonna have some much more difficulty caring for this patient. I think that's why I was okay when I got electrical. I think my fat in my body saved me when I had that electrical current. It just went right through the top of my arm and out my elbow. <laughs> So we're always looking for the exit point, right? We're always looking for the entry point and we're looking immediately for the exit point. That's going to give us a clear cut idea of what happened. A, a entry point is usually on the hands. That's where electricity is typically touched. And then the exit point hopefully would be on somewhere lower in the arm, the elbow, maybe even the upper arm, but we're not anticipating touching electricity unless like in the movies, you know, when they're touching, they're, they're like holding it, the electricity, and they're just like standing there holding it. Obviously, that's going to be traveling through the whole body. Um, and we'll talk about like the different factors that make an electrical current more damaging. Will the exit and ex entry wounds look different from each other? Kind of like, you know, with a gunshot wound, you can tell which one is entry and which one is exit. Unfortunately, tissue, no, but... like we can see here, there's an entry and an exit wound. They typically look the same, but we're looking at the circumstances of how the patient got electrocuted in the first place. Um, where were they at? How is their body positioning? If they're still conscious, they could um, tell you what happened. Um, for a patient where, so you can see here, this patient has an electrical burn through the back. We can see areas where it perforated the skin, but we can kind of tell our areas where the electricity hit, but we can't really see the extent of damage until that tissue breaks mm -hmm. down. Right now, this burn doesn't look too bad, right? But yeah. after 70, yeah. it looks bad, but like, it looks pretty imagine, bad. <laughs> every, imagine everything that's going on under the surface, right? If this whole area starts breaking down, you're going to have a lot more um, problems with tissue and in tissue integrity and infection prevention. Um, really so looks like you're it. Kind of circling that is at the entry for this one. It didn't specify what would be the entry and exit. 
my guess is this would be the entry just because it has the just the like the finite point and then we have the various points of exit over here but again just an educated guess isn't electricity always going to travel downward i don't because it's be grounded it's always going to look well i know so I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing if you're, if it's usually your hands that are touching something that it's going to travel downward from there and not go up into your brain. But I don't know if that's just because it's trying to either stay grounded or if it's just because most of the time that's our contact point. So it's going to travel downward from there. So, you know, how in movies when they like stuff in that big puddle of water, that's got like the electrical cord in it, where does it go from there? Cause that's from the ground. So well, that's gonna, going up. Remember their whole, like when you see that their whole body is getting electrocuted. Water is a great conductor of electricity. So you're not just touching and oop, pull your hand away and touching a live wire or something. You're actually standing in a completely electrified solution that's going. And so in that case, it is kind of traveling upward in that sense. Or depending what else you're touching, like if you have one hand on the electrical cord and one hand on something metal, it's going to just. Yeah, be going yeah, back go and forth. Across. Yeah. You guys are morbid. I like it. Oh. <laughs> you're thinking worst case scenario. I'm holding a metal, I'm holding a metal rod. I'm holding a metal umbrella. I get electrocuted by lightning and I'm standing in electrified water. We're just I'm thinking of cool movie scenes. Yeah, I know. Or electric oh, chairs. Electrical, electrical burns in the movie scenes are always like above and beyond. So here we have a pediatric electrical burn, um, a child that was sucking on an electrical socket. You can see tissue damage here. So would that regrow deformed or would that just like? Plastic surgery. You have to wait to see that 72 hours after there's no exit wound that it shows, but I'm guessing it's probably somewhere right out of the face. Um, and then, yeah, probably need to have a plastic surgery consult to fix that. Mm. So this looks much worse than that other electrical burn picture though, right? That just looks like burnt meat. It's like your hot dog. That's, that's not as bad as what the students said last time where they said it looked like beef jerky. Ew, no, it looks like an overcharged hot dog. So how is this, because it looks almost scaldy. Mm -hmm. This is probably greater than 72 hours post burn. We see that he already has this Foley catheter inserted. You kind of just use your clinical judgment. You're looking around the room. We've got lots of bags of fluid that we're bolusing here, most likely 72 hours post. We can use our rule of nines and we can see that coagulation necrosis and all these dark areas where the tissue has been completely destroyed. So does he have an imprint of his sock on there? It looks or like it. Yeah, right here. Looks like the little ridges. So it's just not necrotic, necrotic under the sock. Like how does that work? Because I would think it would travel all the way through and like probably burn off the sock or something because that's just material. I don't see the exit point of entry. It does look exit point um, or entry point. It does look like it's pointing to the entry point here. And then because his upper area, his trunk doesn't seem to be too affected, mm -hmm. um, but his other leg was affected. So, but down that way, because that doesn't look as bad as just above it. No. So maybe the exit point is kind of in this charred area over here. And this is just the tissue resulting tissue inflammation. Mm. Or maybe it's just time. And they're just waiting for that. Because even up here, it doesn't look too terrible. But it's definitely I'm really there. craving a pig roast right now. Ew. <laughs> oh, my God. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought it looked like, too, Zach. Like just like a full pig. Yeah. I mean, it just looks, I'm fucking hungry now. I'm going to Photoshop an apple right here. There you go. <laughs> Are you sick, sick students? 
I'm going to vomit. So current, obviously, that passes through vital organs is going to produce more life-threatening sequelae. We're focused on the heart. Our heart functions on an electrical system. So any electricity that goes through it will disrupt our sinus rhythm or AFib or whatever heartbeat that we have currently and can send a patient into VTAC or VFib. Um, electrical sparks may ignite patient's clothing, causing a combination of a thermal flash injury or a flame injury as well if it catches on fire. I had a patient with that last semester. He had been doing a kitchen reno and reached into the wall and grabbed a wire. Mm. And it was like cardiac arrest just immediately. His wife did CPR, but um, he was without oxygen for so long that by the time he got to the hospital, he was just- Brain dead. Yeah, very brain injured. Yeah. His penis still worked though. <laughs> right. That was my cath experience. You are never going to live that down. 10 years from now, <laughs> Zach is going to send you a Christmas card. It's probably going to have a picture drawn on it. Hey, you remember this time in nursing school way back when? So when electricity passes through muscle, it eats through that muscle, breaks that down. So now we've got myoglobin from the heart. We've got hemoglobin um, that travel from the damaged red blood cells down to the kidneys. They clog it up. Um, we're looking at rhabdomyolysis here. We have creatinine kinase, myoglobin, um, myoglobinuria, acute tubular necrosis, and eventual acute kidney mm -hmm. injury. We already have a problem with the kidneys because of whatever type of burn is happening. If there's any swelling or inflammation, we have fluid shifts into our second spacing and sometimes third spacing if it's moving into blisters. So we're already going to have some hypotension that's going to be decreased perfusion to the kidneys. And then the perfusion that is going there is bringing these waste products, basically clogging up the system, which is why lots and lots of fluid, which one does not belong and why? The possum. But they're not going to pee, right? No. You're wrong, Risha. <laughs> this, this cat right here, doesn't he look shady? Shady as shit. Look at those eyes. That cat's got plans. That possum is just doing it. Look how innocent that little possum's face is. That thing's right? got rabies. It shouldn't be out during the day. This cat, right? No, the, the possum shouldn't be out during the day. It's got Possums rabies. don't carry rabies. <laughs> oh, they don't. Well, Thank to each their own. They're very friendly. Hey, back on topic here, uh, the, the myoglobin thing, I mean, that's not necessarily specific to electrical burns, though, is it? Because any, like, skeletal muscle damage from a burn is going to release that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. okay. I think they're focusing more on that in your book and in this PowerPoint um, because an electrical burn that travels through muscle has the tendency to do much more damage. Does that make sense? And yeah. that burn from a thermal burn has to be that um, superficial, I would say probably partial thickness deep um, I'm getting them confused deep it needs to be a third degree or a fourth degree burn. Okay. And it's very rare that somebody would let that thermal burn go that far unless, you know, they're passed out or something like that, where they can't stop it for it. But even then it's only affecting that particular spot on that muscle, whereas electrical burn is shooting through that entire muscle. So, so if you're going to get a burn, a thermal burns the one you want. A thermal, if you're going to get a burn, a thermal burn on like your finger for like two seconds is what you want to go for. So like with the myoglobin, are we going to see the lactic acids go up then because of the muscle breakdown? You are going to see the lactic acid go up, but the most you're going to see that with be your smoke inhalation injury from that switch, that oxygen carrying. Once our body can't, doesn't have any oxygen, it switches to that anaerobic metabolism and that lactic acid builds up pretty quick. For the burns, is it safe to say that like your entry point for an electrical burn would probably have the most damage to your skin? Or like, how does the damage kind of, I know it's like all throughout, but how does like, if you're visually looking at it, like, where would you see the most? So 
It looks more like the pictures that I've seen that the exit point gets it the worst because electricity goes and it travels through and destroys everything. And then we can have like those multiple areas of exit. The initial entry point is going to have some damage to it, but it's the pathway that electrical current takes that's going to determine how bad that injury is. So if you have somebody where it goes through, if there goes through their right arm and exits their left leg, then you're thinking all of those organs that it crossed through and then the thick thigh muscle that it went through um, kind of is going to determine the extent of injury. And that's why it's hard to use the rule of nines until after that 72 hours after like that picture showed, um, we can actually see the damage that has been done. I kind of like a lightning bolt where it branches. Mm -hmm. and... Also for the rule of nines, we're not converting that percentage, right? No. We're just keeping it. We're keeping the percentage the way it is. Okay. So here was kind of what that video went through and showed um, what I'm going to reiterate on. A superficial partial thickness burn involves the epidermis. Um, deep partial thickness involves the dermis. And then we've got our full thickness burn third and fourth degree. It's going to involve all skin elements, nerve endings, fat, muscle, bone. So here's a really nice picture. We've got our first degree superficial partial thickness is epidermis. This is our sunburn. Deep partial thickness might be just, a you know, like a thermal injury burn, flash, flame, scald. Um, it's going to be some blistering with that. Um, and that's going to be your second degree burn. And then third and fourth degree, um, it's kind of once it starts involving the fat and then muscle, and then our fourth degree involves it's down to the bone. Nerve endings are shot. Area around the burn is going to be extremely painful, but at the burn site itself will not be painful because the nerve endings are destroyed. So severity of the burn injury, we're going to use our rule of nines or our lung router, depending on what we're doing, but then it's also going to determine, um, be determined by the location. So face, neck, and chest, we're automatically jumping to respiratory obstruction. So we're thinking mechanical restriction. Um, if the burns are to the face, we've got swelling around the face, around the throat, we've got swelling on the chest. We have inability to expand our chest, especially when scar tissue develops. Um, scar tissue is fibrous in nature, resisting resistance to stretching. Um, so inability to use, to take a deep breath inability to use our accessory muscles. Hands, feet, joints, and eyes, we're worried about self-care. Obviously, we use our hands and our feet for a lot of things, our joints for our mobility, and then our eyes to see. Ears, nose, buttocks, and perineum are infection. So buttocks, perineum, we already know, you know, fully catheter, we can put a flexiseal or rectal tube in. Um, nose and ears, we want to make sure that we're using a rolled towel, that we're keeping the ears and nose free from pressure. If your patient is a stomach sleeper, we don't want them sleeping on a burned nose um, for risk of infection. And then same thing with the ears for side sleeping. So a circumferential burn, I mentioned this earlier, is a burn that goes around the entire extremity. And the problem with that, we're worried about circulation distal to the burn site. If the nerves and blood vessels are destroyed, not so much the nerves, but they'll be destroyed too. But if the blood vessels are destroyed, then we're worried about getting circulation um, to other areas that need it. So an escarotomy is surgical procedure performed by a burn physician, sterile procedure, where they actually create new pathways, kind of like an exterior cabbage, so to speak so that that circulation um, can be restored. Um, also worried about compartment syndrome. So we're gonna go with our, however many P's that we have, 12 P's, your pain, your pressure, paralysis, paresthesia, it's press, pallor. What am I missing? Or what compartment syndrome? The P's, pain, paralysis. Uh Paresthesia, pulselessness, paralysis. That's pain. Five, right? Press for capillary refill. 
polar for temperature. Um, so we're worried about Ven VTE, venous thromboembolism, because what happens when burn fluid can move rapidly out of those cells into the intravascular compartment and actually out of the intravascular compartment into the cells and actually into the burned tissue causing third spacing or blisters. Um, a lot of times it's the plasma itself leaving behind those red blood cells. So the term that's used for that is going to be sludging where now you've got um, coagulation developing from these blocked red blood cells that don't have enough free flowing fluid to move into and platelets that can kind of aggregate. So let's move on to our three phases of burn management. So we've got resuscitative. So this is the emergent phase, right? This is like the most important we're trying to stabilize. And basically what this is, is we're counteracting the effects of hypovolemic shock. The acute phase, what we're worried about the most in this phase is infection. Typically infection is from the patient's own flora. We've got natural organisms on our body at all times. But if they move into an area of burn tissue, they can cause an infection. If it gets into the blood, they can become septic. And then rehabilitative is gonna be restorative. So this is gonna be where your skin grafting is gonna occur. Um, reconstruction, reconstructive surgery is gonna happen. And then um, physical therapy and occupational therapy to go back to the patient's baseline or close to the patient's baseline. So our primary concerns with emergent phase, you know, it's going to be up to 72 hours. We have this massive movement of fluid out of our vascular space. We're worried about hypotension. We're worried about lack of oxygenation to our vital organs. And so essentially our hypovolemic shock. And then we're worried about the patient's edema, especially if it's in that upper area, but like blocking off our respiratory system. Perry, are you learning something? No, I'm looking at puppies online. Why are you looking at puppies? I want to get a puppy. Don't get a puppy. Puppies. Take a vote. Who thinks my sister should get a puppy? Me. She kills plants. Well, there was only one out of 18. Whatever, I'm keeping two plants. Who my should puppy. get a possum? Get a possum. Or start off with just like a cat. Get a possum. A they're, they're really underrated. Quick poll right now. What was that, Dennis? Well, I said you should do a poll. A Zoom poll. A Zoom poll, yeah. Should my sister get a puppy? Um, maybe like a chinchilla. You seem more like a chinchilla person. So our Parkland-Baxter formula, four milliliters times the percentage body weight, we're gonna go ahead and use our rule of nines to determine this. Um, this was on those practice questions, times the weight of the patient in kilograms. You're gonna get a big number, it's supposed to be big. We're bolusing with them with fluid, right? The first half of that number that you get is gonna be administered over eight hours. If you break that down per hourly, it might come out to like 300 ml per hour. That's normal, right? If we're bolusing, if we have a liter bolus over an hour, that would be running your pump at 999. So think about like you're bolusing this fluid over that eight hours, monitoring their edema. They're, they are already going to look edematous from the burn itself. They are gonna, their edema is going to worsen with all this fluid because that capillary membrane still has been, it has not been restored, right? So as we're bolusing them this fluid, it's going into the intravascular space initially because that's how we're administering it as IV. We're just trying to maintain their blood pressure while that fluid keeps moving out. We keep giving it in. We're trying to maintain that blood pressure until this emergent phase resolves. Olga, what's up? I have a question about this formula. Uh, for example, we have a number for first eight hours, but a patient admitted like four hours after burn. Do we have to divide this amount for four hours or for eight hours? No, it's from the time of care. So as soon as they come, we don't make up for lost time. We're still following this formula for the first 24 hours based on their burn percentage. And really we're only gonna use this if they've got like a 15% um, BSA. We're not gonna use this if somebody comes in and just like the anterior surface of their arm is burned. We're not gonna, you know, they're probably gonna get fluids but we're not using the Parkland Baxter to, to give them a bolus. Um, you know, unless it's at that 
So um, one, one question I have, we're yeah. giving them all these fluids, all their current fluids are going where they're not supposed to go and mm -hmm. their kidneys aren't working. Yeah. So they are so going to puff what up. What happens to all that fluid? So once that capillary membrane is restored, profuse diuresis occurs from the patient. So all that extra fluid that we gave them is going to be diuresed by the kidneys if our fluid resuscitation was adequate. Now, if they are still experiencing acute kidney injury and they're not producing urine, we can try something like mannitol, an osmotic diuretic, to help them get rid of that excess fluid. Mannitol the... makes your kidneys work? Mm -hmm. It's an osmotic diuretic, so it pulls fluid out where it needs to go and excretes it. Okay. What is the threshold? Is it the 15% BSA where you start to use the Parkland formula to resuscitate? Okay. Yeah. And why wouldn't you use 0.9 normal saline, especially because the patient's probably hyponatremic? Why would you use lactated ringers instead? So lactated ringers is actually kind of, they use it a lot with surgeries when there's blood, when there's blood loss or whole volume loss. Um, they use it with burns because the whole point of it being lactated, it is, it's already kind of run through, uh, I looked it up, it's hard to explain, but like how your liver metabolizes the mm -hmm. excess fluids, it. It so helps when patients are more in like a lactic acidotic state. Okay. Yeah. I can't explain like, cause I forget, but I just know if the patient's in more of a metabolic acidotic state, it helps with that. Okay. So you wouldn't use normal saline? You might. I mean, they're kind of used interchangeably. Chris, they're both considered crystalloid solutions. I just know that lactic, um, lactated ringers is better for patients that have some issues with lactic acidosis. I'll find the rationale and post that when I post that video. Well, like, I wonder it'll do me good to refresh. OB, when I worked OP and like they would do C sections, I don't know why, but the OB floor only ever had LR. They never had normal saline. For my, like I said, my wife told me a while. Surgical. My wife told me a while back that there's actually an argument like in the medical community that lactated ringers is more closely similar to our current fluid status than 0.9. So I guess people are using it more and more, even not in surgery and stuff. So mm -hmm. I guess it's becoming more the go-to, but. I typically in the ICU would always see normal saline, but it always had additives in it. Like it always would have like extra potassium or sodium bicarb and just whatever the patient was short on. I didn't really see lactated ringers that much unless I floated to surgical floors, then they were all on lactated ringers. It seems mm -hmm. like it's used a lot in the OR, which makes sense for C-section for it to be used in that and the whole blood loss from um, having the baby. So for the Parkland formula, you would only utilize this like protocol if it was greater than 15%. Mm-hmm. So if you had like just the one arm and it's just 9%, then you're not really doing the fluid replacement like in this manner. You're just giving them just fluids. Yeah. You're giving them fluids like you would give anybody else fluids, but really you're just treating the, there really is not an, an emergent phase. We're not worried about hypovolemic shock with a minor burn. Does that make sense? Like even a sunburn, even though your sunburn might be a lot of your rule of nines, we're looking at the depth and because it's, you know, partial thickness, superficial, it's just the epidermis. We're just using, we automatically go to our acute phase where we're just manage, managing for infection control, making sure that that person with that arm, that they have clean, sterile dressings, silver sulfatidine applied to that arm that was burned, but and giving fluids, but we're not, there's really no emergent phase that we need to treat. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to think like, if, the, if you have a burn and it's like your whole arm, it's your whole leg, like, or even your whole, anterior, well, if it's anterior portion or posterior portion of your leg, like, wouldn't that still require or cause a lot of fluid loss? Wouldn't it still cause like, 
So they're going to give them fluids and there's going to be some edema associated with that, with the blisters, but there's not going to be such a significant amount of fluid loss that it's going to cause a big change in their vital signs. They're not going to become very hypotensive and tachycardic, like somebody with, you know, major loss of fluid would have. And then does that matter if it's like the, the location, like if they had like their, their right arm, but their groin was also um, burned. So like, would they oh. lose more fluid or caught, like, would there be like an obstruction issue if it was like just their groin or something? Well, who's the person? Is it Zach? Cause I think we would just throw him a bandaid and some. <laughs> well, I guess you can figure out like, cause you're, if it's your head, your head's only 4.5, but your head's also very vascular. It's your airway, your breathing and circulation. So, so then we're still going to, we're still going to give fluids, but we're not going to use the Parkland Baxter formula. And what they're more concerned about is oxygenation and mechanical restriction. If it's going to be your head that's burned. So it's not, we're not so much worried about the fluid shifts that occur with the lower percentage burn. We have to figure out where's the burn and how is that going to affect the patient when they enter that acute phase. So if it's on their hands, if it's on their feet, if it's on the perineum, then we're going to be more worried about infection. If it's on the face or the chest, we're worried about that mechanical obstruction. If it's on the leg, we're just worried about infection. There's going to be some edema that develops if it's like the anterior portion of the leg, maybe some minute changes in their vital signs from the fluid shifts, but it's basically not enough fluid shifting. It kind of goes back to our hypovolemic shock where like, if it's greater than 30%, we replace with whole blood volume. Otherwise we do, they might do like the one ML to every three, like the one ML of every estimated loss, we'll do three MLs of replacement, but it's not going to be like this full, Hey, we're going to give you four MLs times your BSA, you know, or times your body percentage affected times your kilogram and weight to restore fluid that they really don't need. Does that make sense? Because if yeah. they give too much, we can send them into flash pulmonary edema, which we don't want to do. And that profuse diuresis that occurs once that membrane is restored won't occur with this patient because once that membrane is restored, well, great. We gave them all this extra fluid, but there wasn't that much fluid that was lost initially. Does that make, so we don't want them to be fluid volume overloaded. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. It clear. Okay. I have mannequins. There's three. I have, um, Frank, he was grilling and he burned himself on the grill. He was trying to do too many steaks at once. And he went to go talk to somebody and he squirted lighter fluid. So he had chemical burns as well. I had a toddler and a baby. Emergent phase. So our manifestations shock from hypovolemia. So we know our stages of hypovolemic shock. We know our treatment for our hypovolemic shock. Blisters are considered third spacing because of the drastic drop in free moving fluid. We have extreme decreased perfusion to the kidneys, the gut and the periphery. So now we're worried essentially about multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. This is why this is why when I mentioned the tagging system, why like an 80% is would be tagged blue. They're expected to die. There's no coming back from that because of the massive fluid shifts that take place. So paralytic ileus, um, we're worried about curling's ulcers, those multiple areas of ulcers that form in the gastric mucosa from decreased circulation. Um, we're worried about those patients shivering and becoming hypothermic. Um, we love, we lose that skin barrier and we, the patient should be kept clean and dry. The only thing they can have on them is a sterile sheet. It has to be sterile. We can't use blankets or anything that would cause friction and shearing. And then usually their mental status has been retained, which is why burns are so extremely painful. The only time they would have altered mental status if, if it was something that affected their oxygenation. Um, and then that would lead to just that those changes, that tachypnea and the respiratory alkalotic type symptoms, dizziness, disorientation, agitation. 
So this is a great picture of your sludging. So you've got your intravascular space, you've got fluid, sodium, and albumin. Sodium and albumin are gonna pull extra fluid with it once that capillary seal is lost. So we have swelling in that extracellular space. We have that second spacing. Further out of that extracellular space, we've got blister formation, which is third spacing, fluid-filled vesicles. Inside intravascular space, we still have our red blood cells, our platelets. So they are kind of aggregating together, creating this blockage that can lead to a blood clot. After that 72 hours, we've got restoration of that capillary seal membrane, fluid and sodium move back into the cell. We've got albumin outside of the cell. We could administer fluid outside of the intravascular space, outside of, outside of the cell balancing. We can actually administer albumin to help pull extra fluid if their blood pressure is still low, that will pull extra fluid into that intravascular space. Initially here, we're going to see some hyperkalemia. We're gonna see some hyponatremia. So now we're moving into our care of the patient and it's gonna focus specifically on each type of burn. So airway management, um, early endotracheal intubation if we suspect that mechanical restriction is gonna be a problem. If they have an upper airway injury, automatically think, well, the swelling and edema could close off their airway. We can create a new airway by inserting an ET tube and completely bypass that whole system. Um, Escarotomies of the chest wall, if the chest is burned, that's gonna restore circulation, help that diaphragm movement and help that accessory muscle use. Fiber optic bronchoscopy is gonna check for escar and swelling in, inside the lungs of bronchos. Anytime you see scopy, think that they're looking, they're visualizing. Um, they can take a biopsy of the tissue itself, um, but basically that's gonna give um, an indication of whether they have a lower airway injury or are at risk for ARDS. Um, humidified air and 100% oxygen. If they're put on a mechanical ventilator, we're going to do 100% oxygen and PEEP of five or increased depending on what the fiber optic bronchoscopy shows. So your immune system is challenged, skin barriers destroyed, our skin is our first line of defense with, line of defense with our um, infection. Bone marrow is going to be depressed, which means decreased white blood cell production because of decreased circulation. Circulating levels of immune globulins which decreases, white blood cells develop defects. So for our fluid therapy, we're going to be putting in two large bore lines, 18 gauge or larger, 16 or 14, even 14 for emergent. Um, for greater than 15% TBSA. This kind of goes to what we had that conversation about is based on the size, the depth of burn, you know, the age of the patient, individual considerations. If they have heart failure, obviously we're not gonna wanna put too much fluid in. We don't wanna to overwork the heart and then um, have them go into exacerbation of heart failure and fluid volume excess. Um, Parkland-Baxter formula we covered, the first half is going to be given over the first eight hours and then the second half. Basically, if you get your hourly rate, you just divide that by two and that's what would go over the second 16 hours. So we have facial edema, patient is burned, we can see 4.5%. We can see that their neck was burned as well. Initially, they're not intubated, they just have an NG tube inserted. And then we can see in the second picture that we are definitely intubating this patient because of the face and neck injury and chest injury um, and that mechanical restriction. We can see that they are much more swollen in the second picture, which is what's to be expected. And what we're looking at is going to be our urine output. That's going to tell us if our fluid resuscitation is being effective. So in our wound, so we're still in our emergent phase, but our wound care is more focusing on cleansing, keeping the wounds clean and dry. Um, it needs to be kind of like a situation where, you know, like when you're in the shower, if you guys shower, some of you shower, right? 
no, we're in nursing school. We don't have time. I know. <laughs> I know. If you're using, you're in the shower, you're washing your hair, that dirty water from your hair is rinsing over your body. We don't want that to happen with these patients as because of the fact that their own bacteria can cause an infection. So on a shower cart, we're just rinsing them and not repeating over the area and just rinsing them off and just letting that free flowing water fall off of them. Um, in the shower, this might be done like on a shower chair, uh, but better if it's depend again, it depends on like, if it's a full body burn, we're talking about, it's probably going to be a shower cart. If it's just the leg or just the leg and the arm, then we might be able to just use a chair and let the water flow off of them on there. But basically the goal is to make sure that we're not recontaminating an area that has already been cleaned. Um, debridement of dead tissue, that escar tissue, that tissue needs to be removed. And then usually a wet to dry dressing would be performed. Um, this is going to be need to done, need to be done in the OR. It's going to be a sterile procedure, um, that the burn physician will do. I've seen a lot of debridements done at the bedside, but not for burns. Again, I think it's the whole sterility of it. This is pictures of escharotomies of the chest wall, restoring pathways of circulation. Puts the lotion on the skin and does as it's told. <laughs> Or else it gets the hose again. Yes. My sister Amy. set up her elf on the shelf like that. Amy. Yes. So these cuts, do they have to be made because the outside layer of the skin becomes tough? Yeah. It's like kind of that compartment syndrome where those vessels mm -hmm. have been destroyed or they've, they're necrotic tissue or scar tissue formation. And now we have to go through, not we, like I would, I would never do this, but like a burn physician would go through and actually cut through that tissue and restore those areas of circulation. And what types of burns? Is this for all types? All types. Thermal burn that's like circumferential, they might need to do an escharotomy of that extremity distal to where that burn is to restore circulation. This here looks like an electrical burn that they've had to do it for. Um, I would say like not smoke inhalation injury and most likely not chemical injury. <clears throat> this is just like releasing the constriction from the burn. Exactly. It's restoring a pathway so that circulation can travel through that chest wall or wherever the circulation is compromised. You're just basically giving it more space. Yeah, giving it giving it somewhere to go. Right? Okay. Because otherwise, if it was all, if it was just covered, it's just going to what like pull underneath, and then it's just going to kill off that area even more. Exactly. If she doesn't have so if this was she I, I can't tell if it's she or here but if this patient doesn't have you can see it's going all the way down past the gut over to the side underneath the umbilicus if these circulation pathways weren't restored there wouldn't be any circulation distal to this burn so this circulation is helping not only the diaphragm be able to be stretched and perfused, accessory muscle use, it's also restoring circulation to the lower extremities as well. So it's kind of like relieving pressure. So everything can just do its thing. Free flow. Yeah. Because as we know if there's no circulation distal, then we lose the ability to heal there. So essentially, it's like severe hypothermia, like you lose tissue perfusion to that area, it's going to become necrotic and eventually have to be amputated. So if you were to clean this patient, what, how would you be doing that? It's a girl. I'm stupid. There's obviously breasts. <laughs> Just realize that gynecomastia is a thing. Okay. Um, this patient would be in a shower cart, 100%. What does a shower cart look like? I mean, I guess I can Google it. Basically, a cart with a shower on it? With holes in it? 
Yeah. It's a cart with holes in it that you can just like rinse the patient off. It's for, I've seen them used in long-term care facilities too, for patients that can't tolerate sitting up. Um, they'll put them just in the shower cart and clean them that way. Allows for the head to be hyperextended over so you can wash the hair without the dirty hair water going onto the body. So what about the whatever is pooling underneath and stuff? What do you mean? If so if you're cleaning that patient, they're laying down, right? That's why the, that's why there's the holes in the bed. It nothing's it person in a strainer. Yeah. It's like yeah. being in like a pasta strainer. Okay. After all this stuff gets cut, Amy, um, does it like just dry up and fall off or they like cut it and it's like kind of okay. skinning an animal? Like, do they like cut this black skin off and let all everything underneath it get exposed or they just cut this so everything underneath can breathe? They cut, they have to cut off all the necrotic tissue. And then what's going to be the treatment of choice is if this patient survives would be a skin graft. Graft it. Oh God. Okay. Yeah, I don't think a layer I'm... of skin would be put on and grafted onto the patient's old skin. That dressing would turn like a yellowish color, have like some serous fluid, and then eventually the dressing falls off once the skin attaches. Okay. I'm seriously hungry again. Oh no. <laughs> Hey, I think your sister should get like one of those little baby pigs. Oh, instead I would instead of a instead of a dog, because then when she gets tired of it or something, she can just cook that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's party. Oh, oh, what'd you guys eat last night? Oh, we ate Oscar. Exactly. We got hungry. That's what I'm talking about. Although I'm also a broke college student, so if she wants a little puppy, I can go over there, snuggle shit on her living room floor, and she can pay me a few hundred dollars. I'm okay with that. Probably a few thousand dollars. She wants one of those fancy like teacup dogs. Yeah, I'm more like, like a breeder mutt. dog. I'm a mutt. I'm not a I'm not a fancy dog. Regardless, if she gets a puppy, I'm gonna tell her to keep it away from you because I don't trust you not to eat it right now. <sighs> everything, everything else is looking good. I don't think puppies are outside your scope. It's true. <laughs> what do you have last night? Oh, a cocker spaniel, a delicacy. We went Mexican. Right, we have Mexican. Are cocker spaniels like Mexican? Are they Latino? Are there Mexican dogs? I don't think there More are Mexican chihuahuas. dogs. Chihuahuas. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's a spaniel. It's a Spaniard. No. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I didn't major in dog breeding. Okay. Let's get back to our wound care. So infection is most serious threat to further tissue injury. Source of infection is patient's own flora. So the, that cross-contamination is priority. Um, closed method is going to be used on the body. Open method is going to be used on the face. The patient is at risk of blebs on the face, like little pockets of fluid. And once these blub, blebs pop, they form like, um, like a puckering mm -hmm. scar. Um, sterile gauze dressings are laid over topical, topical antibiotics are used unless there's a documented bloodstream infection, then we would give IV antibiotics, but IV antibiotics, because their circulation is so disrupted are not effective against localized infections. So that's why we're going to use a topical antibiotic, but antibiotic and get right to the source. Um, dressing changes are going to vary. Don't worry about that. Here's a nurse. Everything is done sterile, sterile gloves, sterile gowns, sterile mask, sterile cap, sterile boot covers. And she's laying sterile in a sterile field. She's laying silver sulfadiazine on a sterile dressing. And why does she have bare hands? She's wearing Those gloves. Are... They're just very <laughs> naturally. Oh, oh, oh. I'm like, why is she doing with no gloves on? That's gross. What kind I of women's hands are you even looking at that look like that? Those look like naked mole I don't rats. Know. Thought those were real hands. <laughs> I don't fucking know. There's some nasty women out there, man. I don't know. Anybody's wrist look like that? I think it's just double gloved and over like her scrub jacket. It's over her gown, yeah. Yeah. It looks double glove because those look like really fat fingers. 
I guess it doesn't show the rest of her body, but I'm like, man, she's got a nice tan going on. <laughs> I got to get that lotion. So ears should be kept free of pressure. Again, big infection risk, no use of pillows. You can use a rolled towel under the neck. Hands and arms are extended and we want them to have special contracture devices. I know on the floor we use washcloths, but we want them to actually have ones they can put their finger through, their fingers through and hold on to keep their fingers in kind of a contracted, um, prevent contractions, kind of like a flexed position. Pain, as I said, severe pain, there's going to be typically a patient controlled analgesia present a PCA. This pain medication is going to be continuous, continuous, and also have a bolus PCA dose. So it might be hydromorphone, you know, one milligram per 50 ml, and it might be like 0.1, you don't have to worry about this, but like just what I've seen patients have like a very, like a continuous low dose going. And then, um, we can piggyback some things going into different pain medications like morphine or dilaudid. And then they have a button that they could push and there's a lockout to make sure that they can't push it too much, um, get too much pain medication, but uh, like maybe every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes. And then there's a max dose for the hour. So continuous plus their PCA dose. And then they will be on a pulse oximeter as well. That's continuously monitoring their pulse and oxygenation. Um, morphine, hydromorphone, haloperidol is more for anxiety. That's our first generation antipsychotic, um, that's going to decrease agitation rapidly brings down a patient that's having a, a panic attack. Um, lorazepam is our benzo. That's going to help again with anxiety, calm the patient down, increases GABA, Mitazolam, my personal favorite is Versed. That's your heavy hitter. That's mm -hmm. the one that you give and your patient is in traditional La La Land. <laughs> Drug therapy, antimicrobial agents. So silver sulfadiazine is the number one. Maffinide, um, acetate is gonna be another topical antibiotic. Uh, system systemic agents are used when, when sepsis is, diagnosis of sepsis is made. So here comes our repeats. Hypermetabolic state or an energy expenditure is 1.5 to two times above normal. Core temperature may be elevated from the burn, but the patient is at risk for hypothermia due to the fact that we can't put any linens on them and they might be shivering, um, further reducing their core temperature. Enteral feeding is optimal, but as we know, if we've got our paralytic ileus, then we've got to use um, parenteral feeding. So which response is the most appropriate? So two of these answers are right. Increased capillary permeability causes fluid shift out of blood vessels and results in hypovolemia. What do we think about that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sounds pretty good, right? We're not losing a lot of blood because remember that blood stays inside the vessel causing that sludging effect. We're not losing a lot of insight. We are losing more insensible fluid loss, but we're not, that's not what's going to cause that massive hypovolemia. It's going to contribute to it, but eschar surfaces don't lose any fluid. So we're automatically right there, we can cross that off. Other sites that are not have that eschar, that black tissue formation are going to lose more insensible fluid loss. Um, from evaporation because that capillary membrane is destroyed, but that's not going to be your main cause from hypovolemia. Your other best answer would be third spacing of fluid into fluid filled vesicles. But again, that's not really what's the main hitter here. What the main thing is that capillary perme permeability is destroyed, causing fluid stripped out of those blood vessels. You saw that guy's face when it was swollen. You can see um, that edema formation. Which volume is of most concern to the nurse? Blood pressure? Or blood pressure. You're gonna use your airway breathing circulation. You're gonna use your acronyms that you, this is emergency nursing, right? This is an emer one type of our hypovolemic shock. So we're gonna go airway breathing circulation. There's nothing on here related to airway. Um, nothing here related to breathing. 
And then everything else is anticipated. Their, their K actually looks okay, whereas they might be in a hyperkalemic state. Their urine looks good, which they might be in an oliguric state. And even then, we'd still be worried about our blood pressure, right? Our circulation is going to be the most important. Are we going to be using their blood pressure to like assess the effectiveness of the fluid resuscitation as well? Their urine. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably going to have not just their blood pressure, but also like a central venous pressure line inserted. And we're going to be looking at their CVP because that's really indicative of fluid volume. Um, but their urine output, kind of everything together. Okay. But their MAP for perfusion, we need to keep that above 65. Right. right. So we need to be paying attention to that. If that looks good, but we're still not getting urine output, we need to give them more fluid because that's the goal is to restore circulation to the kidneys. We know that if the kidneys are in failure, all this fluid that we're giving them isn't going to have anywhere to go. Um, so that's why we're looking, making sure that we're monitoring that urine output. Um, continuous renal replacement therapy if needed outside of the immersion phase, that would be more in the acute phase. Pull off that extra fluid. I think Evolve so, had put urine output ahead of blood pressure as being a more accurate yeah. measure. I don't know if we need to get that deep into it, but. Being a more, because if they're not getting enough fluid, if their blood pressure looks okay, but they're still not making any urine output, we're still not perfusing that particular vital organ, if okay. that makes sense. Gotcha. So in acute phase, we've got that profuse diuresis, patient becomes less edematous. Um, in this phase, we're mostly worried about infection. Electrolyte imbalance, giving those high levels of crystalloid solutions can cause some issues with that, paralytic ileus, and then hyperglycemia. We're worried about hyperglycemia, um, not only because of our parenteral or enteral feedings, but also because of the stress response that's occurring within the body. I'm going to tell you straight out, don't worry about this slide. I don't want you guys focusing any undue energy or memorizing all of this, but just some reasons why your patient might be hyponatremic, GI suction diarrhea, hypernatremic, inappropriate fluid administration. We want to dilute that potassium. Um, hyperkalemia can be due, there's large amounts of potassium that liberates that intracellular potassium that we saw in that picture. It can cause muscle weakness, EKG changes, too much potassium, and then hypokalemia, vomiting, diarrhea, or prolonged GI suction. Mainly, we're worried more about hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. So infection, early stage, we're worried about hyperthermia, right? Our patient starts running a temp. We're suspecting that they've got a bloodstream infection. Lactic acid is already going to be elevated. Um, we got to find the source and have that documented infection and start the appropriate antibiotics. Hypothermia, as we know, is going to be a later sign of shock um, when it comes to sepsis. Increased heart rate and respiratory rate, decreased blood pressure. Those are our three heavy hitters for all of our shocks, right? Increased heart besides neurogenic. Um, and then our decreased urine output. So as I mentioned, neurological system is usually left intact unless you've got some hypoxia causing issues with orientation. Um, if that's the case, then you've got disorientation, combativeness, hallucinations. We can give medications for that. If your patient ends up being intubated, they're going to be um, sedated with a analgesia present as well. Musculoskeletal system, we're worried about decreased range of motion. If a burn occurs on a joint, we've got, you know, flexion extension on most of our hinge joints. We've got internal, external rotation on our ball socket joints. If we've got scar tissue that forms there, they're going to lose their range of motion in that area. And then contractures can develop too with burned skin. When it heals together, it forms a contracture of that joint. Gastrointestinal system, um, paralytic ileus, they might have small amounts of liquid diarrhea. And basically that's just whatever is left over in the bowel, acid, um, uh, digestion of acid you guys have seen in clinical, right? In patients, like small amounts of like, like a greenish brown stool. 
just from their own body, just digesting their acid in the stomach. That's why we're going to use the enteral route for food. Um, if we can't use the enteral route, then we're going to use the parenteral, but put them on that low intermittent suction to get rid of that excess acid. Um, might have constipation or those curlings ulcers. Curlings oh, ulcer is just a stress ulcer. It's, it's not so much a stress ulcer. It's like an ulcer that's due, it's completely due to decreased circulation to the gastric mucosa, which causes necrosis. And it's in like multiple places where stress ulcer could just be like unilateral, whereas these are like multiple areas of just decreased perfusion to the gut. Okay. But ulcers and ulcer, risk for bleeding. We can... It, because they're not caused by acid, your pantoprazole and your famotidine and, and your um, ranitidine, they're not going to be as effective as they would be with a stress ulcer, but we're still going to give them. Um, increased blood glucose levels, we're going to put them on a sliding scale, be monitoring their glucose every four hours, keeping it between that 140 to 180. Wound care would be daily observation assessment, you know, cleansing is needed, debridement done in the OR, and then reapplying the dressings. It's a great time if they're part more in their rehabilitative phase when we're still doing dressing changes. When those want to make sure that we're medicating with pain medication before their dressing change, and then scheduling PTOT during their dressing change when they have more mobility. Um, we'll talk a little bit about excision and grafting. Don't worry about this is more specialized area of nursing. Um, so eschar is removed down to subcutaneous tissue or fascia. However deep that eschar tissue, it has to be removed. Um, graft has to be, as I mentioned earlier, has to be placed on that clean viable tissue. So tissue that has circulation restored. Wound is covered with an autograft. This tissue can come from either the patient or it can come from a donor. They have patients that are organ donors. They can actually donate their skin and they will be taking their um, skin off. So here's the split thickness. This is a graft to a burn. This picture grosses me out to no extent. This is a dermatome that actually removes skin. It's and a cheese graver or an apple peeler. Mm. I'd say more of an apple peeler than. It's like slipper. one of those pasta rollers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's actual skin. You can see it's tourniqueted above and below and then grafted. Blech. Did you guys get a good look at that picture? We good? Now I'm craving pasta. Better. <laughs> you just always come to my lecture hungry. It's like 1130 in the morning and he's like, oh, I could really go for a five course meal right now. That's how I, I am. I'm Speaking hungry. truths. I wish I had your metabolism. You know what I had for breakfast? Oh, I'm a fat oh. ass. What are you talking about? And when my stomach growls, I tell it you get nothing but coffee. I don't care. It's all you get. And then That's your bowels start growling. <laughs> It's also not great for your stomach lining. I'll be fine. I know how to throw a self NG tube in if need be. So here's cultured epithelia autograft. If it takes the patient's own skin, you're still going to see the lines where the skin attaches as scars, but the skin color, no matter how close you get it, it's going to be different in tone you're going to be able to see a donor site that's harvested much it's clearer than you would if it's the patient's own skin. So what here I, we have the patient used his own skin and you can see it matches the tone and color. How Which do you the donate attachment a site. dead person's skin? It's dead. There's no, you know what I mean? Like that's what I'm Well, thinking. when you do organ donation, they're typically not, they're just declared brain dead. It takes a lot. You know, some people think like, oh my God, I don't want to be an organ donor. If I could live, they're still going to like, be like, well, she's an organ donor. So let's just let her not live. It's actually not true. You have to meet several criteria. They draw 22 lab, they draw 22 vials of blood on you. 
and they so have to have go. documented tests to say that so you- they physically keep the body circulating they keep the physical body alive until donation time exactly mm -hmm. Gotcha. But it's not like they're going to do it on anybody. They're like, oh, they hit their head. Well, let's take their organs. I mean, unless you go backpacking through Europe, as we talked about. <laughs> but otherwise, it, there's a ton of criteria that you have to meet before you be. And a lot of people are ineligible. If you're in liver failure, forget it. They think the waste products that are, are lack of metabolization of your jaundice, they won't take it. So pain management. So we've got two kinds of pain, continuous background pain means we talk about pain. We talk if it's acute or chronic, this is acute. We talk if it's continuous or intermittent. This is both right. Continuous background pain, IV infusion of an opioid. And then upon discharge, we can do slow release twice a day. Opioid want to make sure that we're educating to take the pain medication before you have the pain it's preventing it from getting worse and to make sure that we can keep it controlled. Um, we can give an anxiolytic, which would be like in the form of a benzodiazepine. Um, if they have like a burst of pain, um, we can give, you know, uh, they can either push that PCA button or we can give something oral. Physical and occupational breakthrough pain, physical and occupational therapy. So during wound cleaning, uh, Passive if needed, we prefer if they can do active and then splints should be custom fitted to make sure that we're not blocking circulation um, to any extremity. High protein, high carbohydrates, small frequent meals, monitor total protein and albumin. So burns, as we know, you get a su superficial burn, you get a sunburn that's going to heal on its own. You get a second degree burn, still probably going to heal on its own, might have a you know, couple scars if you had blister formation. That's spontaneous re of the skin with no scar tissue formation. Um, skin grafting, that's going to take longer to heal. That's again, using either donor tissue or taking tissue from yourself. Usually the inner thigh is preferred. Um, mm -hmm. And it's nice to use your own too, because less risk of, of rejection. Um, and then we're able to rebuild that tissue structure that way. So further into our rehabilitation phase, the most common complication is gonna be your skin and joint contractures. Um, so we're going to be using positioning, um, splinting, and then mobility exercises to minimize the risk of contracture. So here we have a burn to the foot and our healing form this fibrous scar tissue, creating a contracture of the big toe. Here we have burn injury to the neck and chest. We have a contracture of the neck. So home care, you've got that patient that comes in with just an anterior leg burn, um, giving them fluids, you know, putting that initial dressing on, pain management, you discharge with an opioid, monitoring for signs and symptoms of infection, and then skills for dressing changes, how often and what supplies to use. Um, we don't want to use anything. It's cultural. Um, some of you may have heard to put like butter on a burn. Um, it's actually contraindicated because any type of oil retains heat. So it keeps heat in that area. So we want to use water-based creams. Um, they're also better absorbed. And then after major burns, we talked about like patients probably going to need some reconstructive surgery performed. So gerontologic considerations, but puts a patient at risk for a, an older adult patient, a higher risk for a burn would be maybe unsteady gait, 
uh, limited eyesight, diminished hearing, um, that decreased sensitivity, and then the fact that wounds may take longer to heal. Another thing on top of that is we're looking at comorbidities. Do they have a history of heart failure? Do they have a history of diabetes? Um, diabetes is going to slow wound healing as well. Heart failure, we have to be giving them lots of fluid. Their heart is already in a weakened state. Um, it's kind of those types of things. COPD, if they have chest burn, um, you know, they already have decreased uh, CO2 removal. Getting back into our psych content, which all of you loved, right? Very much so. The personality disorders are my favorite. It's crazy. Yeah, and I would go through the book and be like, ooh, that's me. Ooh, that's definitely <laughs> me. Ooh. That's not good. I have obsessive compulsive personality style. I don't have the disorder. I just have the style. I just like things to be the way that they are. You Keep telling agree. yourself that it's okay. No, when you're driving, there are the rules of the road and you need to follow them. Wouldn't you agree? There's yeah. no rolling stops. There's no turning left when the light clearly turned red and you were the last person in line. You don't get to turn left. I'm a little bit of an angry driver. It's just, there's the rules and they're there for a reason. So with our patients that sustained the burn, there's many emotional, psychological needs. We have to assess the circumstances. Um, survivor guilt, if it's related to that. Um, if it was something negligent the patient did, we see some anxiety, some guilt, some depression, and then some PTSD. There also might be new fears that arise. They might become, um, you know, fear of fire, fear of going back to the place where the fire occurred or the injury occurred. If it was an occupational hazard, fear of going back to work, um, those types of things. All we can do is therapeutic communication validation, summarizing, paraphrasing, using silence, letting the patient explain, therapeutic touch if warranted, and then um, referrals. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy would be our of most benefit. And obviously medication management as well. Yay, we're all done. Yippee. The last PowerPoint will not be tested on however, from me, but it might be on HESI. So feel free to review that PowerPoint, but it won't be on my exam, but I guarantee they test on, there's a section on healthcare factors and it talks about healthcare policy and law, it talks about healthcare organizations and it talks about healthcare economics. Um, it was actually pulled from my content because it was like, why is this here? They learned this in first semester. And I was like, please take it away because I hate teaching this because it's not fun and it's super boring. And they were like, yes, we will take it away from you. And I was like, hallelujah. So I still have the PowerPoint there for you, but it will not be tested on. So the questions off your Jeopardy game don't count either? No, that was previous Jeopardy game that I put that on back when it was tested on. Okay. How are we feeling about burns? Pretty straightforward ish. I have a question. So you're gonna give us a picture of burn and we, we need to know, is it like um, partial? Um, you know, what kind of burn is it? No? No. But the pictures helped you learn, right? So you're just gonna verbalize everything? I don't like, remember. There may be pictures, a picture. I don't know. I haven't even looked at your test yet. Why do you guys ask me? Why do you ask me all these hard questions? So we can pass. <laughs> Good rationale. See you again next year or next semester. We're going to be all in person next semester though. Doesn't that sound like fun? No, that sounds terrifying. Nah, you guys want to be done. I get it. That sounds like I'm losing personal time. <laughs> yes, time to spend with your friends and family as we get into our 
what grows spring. Let's see, 422 is picture and description of shower cart. What is Lewis? <laughs> what is what? What is Lewis? So you need to, don't need to fly anything on the cuts, right? No, open to air. We're not putting the antibiotic on them? Ascarotomies, not initially. That depends what phase. If you're in the emergent phase, no, we're leaving everything open to air. Sterile sheet is the most that we can cover them up with. Acute phase, that's the wound healing. Once they've gotten through their circulation and that capillary membrane is restored, then we can dress those wounds. Amy, I have a question about a Parkland formula. Can we apply it for kids as well? Because they have a different fluent. They and have a you different, know? you don't need to know it, but they have a different chart in McKinney, I want to say for pediatric burns. Like they're not, it's not the 4.59%, it's, it's different. For pediatrics, for CPR, do we need to know anything about that? besides like the pads or is it all just based on adult CPR? All based on adult CPR. Okay. So the kids is only really with like um, the bites and the insects and all that stuff. Yeah. Like stings and stuff. Okay. Burned out. True. You realize potassium chloride given IV push or at 100 milligrams per kilogram IV would kill you, dose, right? right? What? That's a fatal dose, right? Well, that's what they use for the death penalty. Right. Yeah. To me, it sounds like you're done. That's what I, that's what I hear. <laughs> Just done. Done with the content. Done with fourth semester. We always look before we listen. Paradox your chest movement. What are we worried about with this patient? Flail chest. Worried about flail chest, asymmetrical chest wall movement, and paradox of chest breathing. Medical emergency. After that, then we listen and then we can feel and then we can obtain a chest x ray and EKG. She's greater, you sick freaks. I love your group. I love your Kahoot names. I was a little worried on that one. You guys took a little while. So blood in the peritoneal space. Remember, it cannot track a retroperitoneal bleed. Hemothorax is in the lung. Development of DIC. We're going to check clotting factors, D-dimer. What's a retroperitoneal bleed? 
blood behind the back and the kidneys um, typically happens like motor vehicle accidents where they have internal bleeding. Bleeding goes by gravity. Okay. All right, good job. Chest pain that's responsive to nitro. Blood pressure looks good on nitro. Headache is a symptom of being on nitro. Our respiratory rate of 18, nasal flaring and 96% looks good. Temperature malaise. If you had to organize these, we'd say absent pulse, that's circulation. That's a time critical emergency. Then I would go with mm, probably the chest pain. Then I would go with the respirations and then I would go to our fluish patient. prophylactic antibiotics don't confuse burns custom fit splints with our open fracture patients Good. Increased heart rate, decreased BP, increased respiratory rate. Yeah. That lightning bolt is holding strong. Two minutes, five cycles. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> loves to ask questions about UAPs, unlicensed assistive personnel, what they can and can't do. They can't assess, they can't teach. I have a question about that. Yep. Because I think in the case study, um, one of the questions said that you can assign monitoring urine output hourly. Isn't that more like a critical thing if you're assessing organ function? So, and it said specifically, as, well, they can assess to the extent that they can't intervene, they can't interpret, but what they're doing is they're just going and they're giving, they're doing a strict eye. They can do eyes and O's so they can give you the urine output, measure it hourly, but
but it's the nurse that's going to go ahead and do, take that information and decide what to do with it next. Okay. Does that make I sense? Guess. Yeah, I guess I'm just used to, like in my hospital, we don't touch like hourly urine at all, like in the ICU. So oh, kind really? of no, not if it's to the point where it's like 30 mLs an hour. Oh, our techs would, we would alternate. So they would go and they would measure from the urometer and then we would just have like a flow sheet. Um, okay. but I'd be the one that was like monitoring that flow sheet. Okay. So you can't write for test purposes. Uh, for Hesse, I don't know what Hesse is going to make you do. To be honest, if you get a practice question on Evolve, maybe that would help. Um, but I would just say, go with your gut. If it looks like something that they're actually like responding and intervening to, then no. But if it's just like measure hourly output, I would say yes. Okay. What if it's said like just document? That would count too, that would right? Say, that would say yes. Yeah, they can document hourly output. job. This is a tough one. Bacteria, yeah. virus, and fungus. Venom typically causes a localized reaction and it can be neurotoxic in nature, musculoskeletal, paralytic. Increase, increase in vascular permeability. Everything else is associated. Direct damage to the epithelial tissue, hypermetabolism, and activation of the coagulation cascade. All part of our inflammatory response. True. It's the stage of MODs, right? So our gut is going to be one of the first ones to be infected. If it said the early stage of shock, this would be false because remember that early initial stage of shock is typically not clinically apparent. It's more the progressive stage of shock that you see problems with paralytic ileus. Hello, Clarice, moving up the board. Burned outs on fire. Understandably so, they're burned out. Nice, 1.5 to 2.0. I have a question, is there, are we gonna have to like calculate anything with that? like with the 1.5 to 2.0 or even like the, the, what is the one ML to like three ML? If we've covered it in your class activities or lecture or PowerPoints, it is fair game for the exam. Okay. Highest priority, I ran out of characters. Oh, damn it. Are you hello, Clarice? Yes, I clicked the wrong one. Oh, man. Bye bye, Clarice. I know. Oh, no, I didn't. Look okay. at you. Insert two large bore IV catheters. We're worried about circulation at this point, systemic inflammatory response hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, large bore catheters, give normal saline, insert the urinary catheter, insert the decompression tube.
Nice. We would go for oral fluids before we went and started an infusion and it wouldn't be albumin. We're not worried about second spacing, lavaging, heat stroke, salt tablets. We do not administer because of the irritation they cause on the gut. So electrolyte infused solutions, PO. Oh, all across the board, superficial frostbite, amputation, <laughs> be more of a deep frostbite who <laughs> escalated quickly. Um, lightweight clothing can cause friction and shearing. No, we want them to use lightweight clothing. Heavy blankets or heavy clothing can cause friction and shearing. Um, okay. Gangrene is more for deep frostbite. So a residual pain might last weeks or even nerves if those nerves were affected. Weeks or even years. This is a good opportunity for a wrong question. You know what I mean? Thought you were going to throw one in there. <laughs> maybe I will, maybe I won't. It's only that transmitted day. through anal sex or something like that. Everyone, everyone knows that. <laughs> maybe I make the question all essay. I don't know. See how I feel. <clears throat> what? Activated charcoal decreases absorption. Thought it was made to puke, make people puke. No, no, that's gastric lavage. And like Ipecac syrup. Anterior and posterior. Oh, God. Okay, so our priority would be pain. pain because we don't want to do anything with a cool bath or cool moist blankets. This is in our hyperthermia patient. We're worried about hypothermia large amounts of heat are lost from thermal burns. So we're not going to give them oxygen because there's nothing to do with their respiratory system. It's the leg that's affected. We would be worried if there was an answer related to circulation because of circumferential and it's anterior posterior, but our best bet at this point is to just give medication for pain. Oh, so long, Clarice. I know, right? Just kidding. Just kidding. You're coming back. We're worried about hypovolemic shock and we're worried about edema, especially around the head, neck, and chest. 
infection is acute, infection is acute, infection is acute. That should kind of like tip you off if you see something in every question, but different. I don't know, maybe. One of these things doesn't belong. Like that one shady ass cat. At Amazon, I hear at my doorbell. What unnecessary thing did I order? <laughs> All right. Oxygenation, semi or high fowlers, open method, sterile precautions. Impaired judgment? Uh, have you met an old person? <laughs> I've met people that are nine years old that are sharp as a tack. Thank you very much. Ageism, all of you. I'm calling all your grandparents. Impaired judgment. Sorry, ma'am. Please put your checkbook back. You're not allowed to use that. I don't trust your judgment. Just another reminder how we always have to read the whole question. What's FT? Full thickness. Keep clicking the computer and not my phone. Um, risk for decreased range of motion. Risk for excuses from Zach. Risk for coagulative necrosis. Oh, we yes. know. Oh, all but. Because it's full thickness. Risk for contracture. Ataxia is difficulty walking. True. It's your standard male patient, guys. So 4.5, 4.5 1%. 1%. I know some of you are probably thinking like 3% or something. Thought he no, was something like me. You, know? plural. you what? I didn't read the plural. <laughs> oh. Another example of always read your question and then read it again. I know it's hard to do with Kahoot. So I'll post the link. You know, this question does not make me feel great at all. Why? Because I will be moving to Arizona in February. Well, this question is based on a true story. When I went to go stay with my parents in Arizona, there was a giant black widow spider outside their casita where I was staying in. And I yeah. said it was Black Widow and my dad said it wasn't. And then he sprayed. And then the next day he's like, oh, because you're so afraid of all these Black Widow spiders. The spider was dead, but it wasn't dead. He captured it in a jar and it was a Black Widow spider. And I have videos and pictures of it. And I was like, see, you all were making fun of me, calling me paranoid about having a Black Widow spider. And there it was, a giant Black Widow spider. So you're saying I'm just never leaving my house. Got it. No, they got scorpions there too. Yeah, that I'm aware. See, you keep saying IV as intervention, I'm assuming, instead of yeah, throwing sorry. me off. I ran out of characters. This Kahoot was so testy with me. Yes, we always want to assess before we intervene. We want to assess the exit point, see what we can get from that iceberg effect. 
14 out of 25, looking good. Lightning bolt. Salsa dancer. 20 out of 25, you go with your bad self, Prairie Dawn. <laughs> Didn't Prairie Dawn win another one? They win them all, whoever Prairie Dawn is. Well, we should find that person and stop them, right? I know who it is. <laughs> this is Hunger Games, guys. <laughs> Good luck, Prairie Dawn. Keep your doors locked. All right, we went a little over time. Thank you for staying. I'll have everything posted by two o'clock today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Last class after our last exam, um, it'll be farewell for us, but I will send you back into the welcoming arms of TJ. How many question or math questions are on the exam? So this one I wanna say is gonna be like about three to five. And is that math? Is that just like dosage calc math or is that math including like the Parkland formula? It's every every type of math. Okay. Can you send out a practice one, please? Practice questions. Like some practice math questions. Hmm. I can create some more. I don't I just have your second dosage calc, but I can make some. Thank send you. those up today. It helps. I do it right before the exam. It just makes me boost my confidence because it's very low in math for some reason even though I'm not getting any of them wrong I just I don't know in the video am I going to see you eating like a roasted pig leg yes when we take the exam yes can I eat during the exam because I will totally do that it will totally flag you and I'm going to have a really horrible time watching that video <laughs> Zach took a bite Zach took another bite Zach flossed <laughs> his teeth Basically. I had better things to do with my time Nah, I really don't, but still. All can right. We, can we use a whiteboard for next exam? Yeah, whiteboard, just make sure you erase it. Um, show it to me blank, front and back, if it's a double-sided, um, and then erase it. And you know, you guys, I know you erase it throughout, some of you do, and then at the very end, just erase it before you show it, okay? Good luck, you don't need luck because you've got knowledge, but I will see you on Thursday, okay? All right. Take care, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.